would make our way on in and find us a place to sit down and a hymn book and open to hymn number 302. Hymn number 302, it is wonderful to be a Christian, number 302. I'm going to ask Brother Mitch if he would open us in a word of prayer, and then we'll sing. Hymn number 302. Life has purpose now it never had before. There is meaning to each day and even more. For a joy and peace I can't explain is mine. Since I found new life in Christ my Lord divine. see if you can guess who I'm going to talk about. Chip Paw. Chip Paw. <laughs> Miss Vicky, I don't know. They made it home safely. Yeah, they did make it home safely. <laughs> anything else? Anybody? Has anybody been in touch with any of the missionaries and knows anything they want to share with the congregation to pray about? Very good. We need to remember them then as they go through that process. And they have 20% of their, or is it 20%? They're right there. Yeah. They're right there. Okay. <laughs> they have 20 or more percent <laughs> support. That's good. The Jerry Burns asked, asked prayer for Ruth as she's studying <coughs> and has all the languages. As she's studying a foreign language. So, all right, that's the jerk birds. Anybody else? I, I think artists were back here just had eye surgery. Okay, uh, somebody had mentioned artists. Uh, remember the little girl with the eye yeah, things? But it wasn't eye, it was esophagus, something okay. with her throat. So, but thank you. Good. Anybody else? And the schooling with the young son. Okay. 
keep remembering them. Good. Very good. Good way to keep up your missionaries. Uh, Brittany Elwert, in the morning, gallbladder surgery. So just pray for things to go smoothly there and everything to go well. Anything else? All right, now, for my missionary. That was good. I want to see if y'all knew anything about your missionaries. You do. That's good. Now, this missionary could wear a crown. I'm trying to get you to guess their names here. Wear a crown. There have actually six of them now in the family. One was just born. King. Very good. Jason King. I know. That was kind of corny. I know. I just... It's Wednesday, right? I'm allowed to be a little off. All right, here we go. He said, we had a very exciting month of October, mainly due to the addition of our fourth child. Nolan King was born on Tuesday, October 13th, and he was several weeks early, and we had to spend a little time in the ICU. But all is well now. He said, uh, we are all in love and just, being, just love being a family of six. We are praying that little Nolan continues to develop and grow physically as well as he understands his need of Christ at an early age. Argentina finally began to, be, to loosen its restrictions, and uh, so everything's been tied down since March. Stores, restaurants started opening as well as malls. Churches are permitted in some areas, but the borders are still closed. He said the people of Faith Baptist Church there are responding well, and everyone is happy and been that they're able to get together again. He said, so please, please pray for Nolan. We're going to go ahead and get his passport, the little one's passport, so that when the borders do open, they can get down there as quickly as possible. So pray for the King family, Jason, Ashley, Marley, Nora, Ian, and Nolan, the family. So let's pray tonight. We've got a lot to pray about. Father, I thank you for a church that believes in prayer, I thank you for a God that hears prayer. I thank you for a pastor that preaches about prayer. I thank you that we can gather in like-mindedness on this Wednesday night, whether we're tired or out of it or whatever we might be, but we're here and we get to hear from you. We pray for our missionaries. We pray for the King family and the new addition to their family. We pray that you would bless them and allow the borders to open up and they could get back to the ministry you called them to, to be at. We pray for Brittany, and Lord, we ask that the morning surgery for her gallbladder would go well. We pray for a little artist, uh, Brubaker, Lord, that uh, this surgery would do well for her throat and that she would continue to heal. We heard, heard of others here tonight, Lord. We praises for them raising support. We ask now that you would just be honored, uh, Lord, and glorified, and thank you for letting us be a part of it. Bless the service in Jesus' name. Amen. What you're supposed to be doing over the next couple of weeks. You remember? <laughs> That's next Tuesday. Deacon nominations. So be praying about your deacon nominations. Be praying about the votes on the budgeted things that we talked about last Sunday at the business meeting. So just a reminder for that. Hymn number 419. 419, my sins are blotted out, I know. 419. What a wondrous message in God's word. My sins are blotted out, I know. I have trusting in redeeming blood. My sins are blotted out, I know. My sins are blotted out, I know. My sins are blotted out, I know. They are buried in the depths of the deepest sea. My sins are blotted out, I know. My heart was black, but now what joy, my sins are blotted out, I know. I have peace that nothing can destroy, 
my sins are blotted out, I know my sins are blotted out, I know my sins are blotted out, I know they are buried in the depths of the deepest sea my sins are blotted out, I know out I know with a ransom host I then shall sing my sins are blotted out I know my sins are blotted out I know my sins are blotted out I know they are buried in the depths of the sins are blotted out, I know. Pastor. Good evening. Good evening. Acts chapter 1. Good to see you tonight. Hope you've had a good week. There's supposed to be frost on the pumpkin in the morning. Yes, sir. I like uh, sweat on my pumpkin. I don't like frost on my pumpkin. <laughs> All right, Acts chapter number one. Sort of give a little review here. Of course, in verse number one and two of chapter number one, we looked at the explanation for writing. Luke there talks about who he wrote it to and a little bit why he wrote it. Verse number three and four, we saw the emphasis upon the resurrection and this emphasis that is throughout the book of Acts. Of course, apart from the resurrection, there would be no Acts. Apart from the resurrection, you and I would not be here tonight. If we, if we would be, uh, we would be uh, dumb and stupid. I mean, if there was no resurrection, why be here? I mean, I'd be somewhere eating me a big steak and sitting around laughing and talking with people. I wouldn't be at church trying to learn God's Word and worshiping with God's people. I mean, there wouldn't be a reason if it wasn't for the resurrection. So, yes, there should be an emphasis upon the resurrection without question. And then verse number 4, the last part of verse number 4, going through verse number 7, and this is where we're still at, where we started looking at what we call the expectation of the promise. The expectation of a promise. Now, what I started teaching last week on this I have had this said to me in the past. Pastor Kent, why, why such a big deal on this passage? Uh, why why uh, deal with the issue of the local church versus universal and visible church? And my answer to that question or that statement is this. It's the difference between truth and error. It's the difference between hermeneutically, and that means proper study, of the Word of God versus having something forced upon the Word of God. And uh, I'll have more to say about that here in a few minutes, but we, we look first of all in this expectation, the promise that was needed. God, uh, Christ said in verse number four, but wait for the promise of the Father which saith he, you've heard of me. And we talked about how here this word wait means to uh, simply remain around, stay where you're at. And uh, we went back to Luke 24 and pointed out that there Christ told them to tarry in Jerusalem until they were endued with the power from on high. So he wanted them to wait. And uh, why did he want them to wait? Because God has predetermined times that he wants things done. You know, from a man's standpoint, it's always easy to say, why did God do this then? And, you know, instead of... That's in God's predetermined decisions. Why did he wait to when he did to send his son? Well, the book of Galatians says it was in the fullness of times, and that simply means it was at the perfect time. And don't you think an initiate God knows when the perfect time for everything is? He does. And here he told them to wait. 
the second thing we looked at was the promise of the Father. Now, as we started looking at the promise of the Father, we looked at a number of different things. And uh, we looked at the purpose of the promise of the Father. And, of course, in looking at the purpose, uh, we have to go back and see that the promise was given in Joel chapter 2. And we looked at that last time. I won't look at it again. But sometime I challenge you to go back and read Joel chapter 2, verse 28 down through verse 31. And you'll see that's what Peter quoted in Acts chapter 2 beginning in verse number 16. And Peter, either Peter was right or the charismatics and, and the group that forces the invisible universal church of, of teaching upon people, either they were right or Peter was right. And I think I know which side I'm choosing. I'm, tutors, I'm choosing Peter's yeah. side. But we saw the promise, and we talked last time about the purpose. Now, in verse number 5, it starts giving the purpose of the giving of the Spirit. And it says in verse number 5, For John truly baptized. Notice that little word for, it means an explanation or giving a reason. For John truly baptized with water. But ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. All right, we said last time that the purpose of water baptism was to show that a person was now saved. It's a public testimony of one's salvation. And we pointed out that that would include repentance, confession, and belief or trust, faith. And that Testimony is always to be done in the local church. See, another Christian can't just pull up down here on the side of the creek and decide to baptize someone. That's totally illegitimate. It has to be in and through God's ordained administrator, and that is the local church for baptism. And that is for that person to give that testimony, I have been saved and I want to identify with Christ and you identify with Christ by it identifying with Christ's body. And Christ's body, according to 1 Corinthians 12, 27, Colossians 1 and verse number 24, is the body of Christ, the local church is. Now, with that, you're also saying, and we pointed this out in Romans chapter 6 and verse number 4, that you are willing to walk in newness of life. A person is really not a candidate for baptism until he's made that choice. I'm willing to walk in newness of life. Now, with that purpose stated, that would tell me that when it comes to the Spirit, because he comes back to, come back to verse number 5, For John truly baptized water, but ye, but ye, the contrast between the water and the Spirit, what is the purpose of the Spirit baptism? The Spirit baptism was to show that one had been saved, Again, included in repentance, confession, and faith through grace through faith. And that he wanted to totally identify with Christ through his local body, the local church. And that he was willing to walk in the newness of life. You say, well, that's the same thing you said about water baptism. Absolutely. It was for the same purpose, but there was an added element. And that added element was a testimony to the Jews that God now, God's glory now had filled the church just like it had filled the temple, just like it had filled the tabernacle. And that's where the Jew knew that he had to come to worship God. And now God has given the testimony to the Jew. And I say that because every single time that you find an exhibition of what takes place in Acts chapter 2. The speaking in tongues as an evidence of them being filled and a part of the fulfillment of Joel chapter 2, Jews were present. It was to show that Jew that God had now inserted the Gentile into the church. And as Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, to make one new man to tear down the middle wall of partition between the Jew and the Gentile, and to have one man. And that, that one man is the local church, the body of Christ in the local church. 
That was the purpose of Pentecost. And we'll talk more about that here in a minute. Now, last time, as we were looking at this passage, so we saw the promise, we saw the purpose. I gave you what I called the positions last time. And let me restate those when it comes to this, this Pentecost experience. And the reason why I'm bringing this element into it is because the majority of groups out there, notice I don't want to say churches, because believe it or not, a lot of groups out there call themselves church. They're not a New Testament church because they don't meet the New Testament qualifications for a church. They teach that the church started on the day of Pentecost and that it was a part of, at that moment, everybody became a part of the universal, invisible church. The Catholics, I told you, helped to what they called a universal, visible church. A universal, visible. And of course, they taught that salvation was in the church. That's what they taught. By the way, that's what they still teach. All right? Along came the Protestants. Now, when I say Protestants, they were Catholics. They were a part of the Catholic Church. And these men started reading their Bibles, and all of a sudden they, they saw and clearly understood that what the Catholics were teaching was not biblical. And they started complaining. They started preaching otherwise. And what happened? The Catholics threw them out of the church. Now, here's a group of men that still believed that salvation was in the church. Now they find themselves outside the church. All they were trying to do was reform the church, not get rid of everything. They were simply wanting to reform it to bring it into more in line with the Bible. By the way, none of the Protestants that got kicked out of the Catholic church ever got rid of all the baggage that came along with the Catholics. Every single one of them, every single one of the groups, down through the history of the church, persecuted the church. Every single one of the groups of Protestants persecuted the Bible-believing believer. Every single group did. Now, that brought the, the people that became known as the Protestants with the problem. They believe that salvation was in the church. They've been kicked out. Now they come up with a little different view. They say, we believe in an invisible universal church. Catholics held on to a visible universal. Now the Protestants teach an invisible universal church. The Charismatics teach that what took place at Pentecost is something that you should want and you should seek for. Now I'm going to make this statement and I'll, prove, I'll, I'll say more about it a little bit later. You, you can't seek for that which does no longer exist. If you seek for that which no longer exists, you're going to waste a whole lot of time looking for something you can't find. And that's what the Charismatic Crown does. They've, they've become so uh, eager f for this, and that's not the right, what I'm wanting, but now they even teach people how to speak in tongues. They put them in tra training, in classes to learn how to do it. If it's something God gives you, it's not something you have to learn. Anyway, and... Then I pointed out that the historical Baptist position of the church is it didn't start on Pentecost. It's not universal. It's local. It is visible. And that in order to be in the local church, you must be born again. You must be scripturally baptized by immersion. And that it is totally autonomous, not ruled over by the vicar, pope, or a group of cardinals, or any priest. Big, big difference in position. Now, we also pointed out last time that it was predicted by John the Baptist. 
And I read last time four verses in the Gospels. In every one of those, John said that he was going to baptize with water, but there was another one coming after him that was going to baptize with, and let me emphasize that, with the Holy Spirit. In each one of his references in Matthew 3, Mark 1, Luke 3, and John 1, all pointed to that person coming after him as Jesus Christ. We also looked in Acts chapter 1 where Christ, not only did John predict it, but you'll see that Jesus promised it in John 1 verse 5 that we read last time. He said, I'm going to send you to promise the Father that ye have heard from me. And we looked at John 4, we looked at John 7, we looked at John 14, we looked at John 15 and John 16. All those places Christ said, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. It is going to be a fulfillment of the promise of the Father. It's from the Father. We, we looked at those verses. We also last time looked at, and we're going to go now if you would, to Acts chapter 10. And this is what I call the proof from Peter. Uh, we, we looked at that, commented on it a little bit last time. And we'll mention more about it here in just a few minutes. But go with me to Acts chapter 10. Now as you find yourself in chapter 10, let's begin reading at verse number 44. Now you know the context, and we'll look at it more when we get there. Of course, Peter was sent to Caesarea. And uh, while he was there, of course, he had a, I guess, a vision where he saw that nothing was to be considered unclean. And of course, as soon as he got through with that, uh, some men were knocking on his door, and the Spirit of God told him to go with them, and he was taken to Cornelius' house. And he was to go to Cornelius' house and preach. And in verse number 34, it says, Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Now remember, Cornelius is a Gentile. And he preaches to him... And uh, he and his household get saved. Now with that background, verse 44 it says, While Peter yet spake these things, the Holy Ghost fell on all them that heard the word. And they of the circumcisions which believed were astonished. Notice, of the circ that means the Jews. They were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because of that on Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Jews just couldn't, they just couldn't believe it. The G Gentiles get to get the same gift that we Jews have? See, they were so prejudiced and thought that they were the only ones that could get to God that God had to do a revolutionary work to change their mind. He had to do a revolutionary work in Peter's life through that vision of letting down of the unclean animals and telling them, don't you say that's unclean anymore? What I've made clean? Let's go on here. Verse 46. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God, then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that there should be baptized, not be baptized, which would receive the Holy Ghost as well as we? Now notice, baptism comes after salvation. And uh, here in the book of Acts, receiving the Spirit took place before water baptism. Right? And just today, like today, when we become saved, we receive the Spirit of God at the very moment of belief. Okay? And then, through obedience, we choose to be baptized. But here, in chapter 10, we see what caused chapter 11. All right, chapter 11, you find in verse number 16, uh, we'll back up to verse number... We start in verse number 14. Of course, Peter goes from Cornelius' house, calls such a fervor of you know, what happened with the Gentiles that uh, he had to go back to Jerusalem and explain it to the church there at Jerusalem. Because some of those brethren back at Jerusalem got upset that he went in and ate with Gentiles. And he has to explain himself. Verse 14. Who shall tell these words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved? And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he saith, 
how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Now, notice in that verse, Peter says almost the exact word is what Christ said in John or in Acts 1, verse 5. If you flip back over there, you'll see it. Where he says, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with, and I'm emphasizing that word with again. And the reason why, because the four gospel references use the word with the Holy Ghost. Christ in Acts 1.5 uses the word with the Holy Ghost. Peter in 1.16 says with the Holy Ghost. Now, with that said, go with me to 1 Corinthians, please. 1 Corinthians, chapter 12. 1 Corinthians, chapter 12. And we'll, we'll step out of what I call the proof from Peter and step into the precise detail from Paul. 1 Corinthians, chapter 12. And notice, please, verse number 12. For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Now notice verse 27. And ye, now who's he talking to? He's talking to the church at Corinth. Ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. He's talking to the the body of Christ at Corinth. Now he said there's one body. Over in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 5, he says there's one baptism. I asked this question last time. Is Paul confused? Or is the Protestant, quote, fundament, a person that calls himself simply a fundamentalist, are they confused? Because I, I'm saying, are they confused? Because they teach two baptisms. They teach a water baptism and a spirit baptism. Paul says there's one. And you say, all right, Pastor Camp, if there's only one, explain verse number 13. Notice verse 13, chapter 12. For by one spirit, now I want to stop right there. Now I want to stop because the word by, the word by here, is the translation of the exact Greek preposition that I have been emphasizing with. In four places in the gospel, Acts 1.5, Acts 11.16, the preposition is translated with. It can be translated by means of, but nowhere. Listen, come here. This is, this is the big key right here. Nowhere is it translated as the agent. Now, there's a difference between means and an agent. An agent uses a means of doing something. And what verse number 13 teaches and what the six other reference teaches is the Holy Spirit is a means, not an agent. Every one of the other verses taught that Jesus Christ is the agent of baptizing with the Spirit. Every one of them did. Turn with me to the book of Titus. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3 clearly teaches the agent of the baptism of the Spirit. Notice, please, verse number 5. Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Now, who does it say in verse number 6, shed the Holy Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ. The word through shows agency. The agent of Jesus Christ. Fulfilling the promise in all the other six verses that I've read, it says He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. 
The Holy Ghost is the means. Or I could say it this way, the medium. Just like the water was the means or the medium which that bodily, bodily baptism, water baptism took place in. The water. Jesus Christ is baptizing these believers in Acts chapter 2 in the Holy Ghost to empower, remember Luke 24, 49, until you be with, endued with power. It was for the purpose of empowering them. So the gift of the promise of the Father, notice I said the gift of the promise of the Father, could be fulfilled on that day in a way that would get the Jews' attention. And so we see in this passage then the precise teaching of Paul. I pointed out last week in Romans 6, Galatians 3, and Colossians 1, was three other places that Paul taught about baptism. And I pointed this out. I said, when hermeneutically studied in this context, each one of those passages teach water baptism. Almost every single commentary that I've looked at on those passages written by a fundamentalist or a Protestant all teaches those passages teach spirit baptism. That is forcing that belief on them taking those verses out of their context to teach their position instead of letting the context teach the position. Remember, Paul said there was one baptism. Now, we're, you're going to have to make up your mind which one of these views you hold to. If it's the Baptist biblical view that's ex hermeneutically taught, or is it something that comes from false teaching that's forced upon it? You say... What's the conclusion of all this matter? Well, here's some conclusions. There's only, the only reference to baptism by the Holy Spirit in the epistles is found right here in 1 Corinthians, and that is only if you take it from a false teaching position. Here's a question. Is the Spirit baptism where Christ baptizes with the Spirit, or does the Holy Spirit do the baptism? Well, the clear conclusion of Scripture is Christ does the baptism. Six times it clearly says He would do it. The seventh time in Titus clearly says that He did it. Is Here in, in 1 Corinthians 12, is the body of Christ universal, invisible, or is it local, invisible, and composition? Well, in the book of 1 Corinthians, it's clear. It's local, and it's visible. Go back to chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, and notice verse 2. Unto the church of God which is at Corinth... Paul clearly understood that the church at Corinth was local and it was visible. Notice chapter 4 and verse number 17. It says, For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son, faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which is in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. And notice how Paul points out that there was many local churches. Notice also chapter 6 and verse number 4. If then you have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least established in the church. I tell you what, it would be extremely difficult for church discipline to be done in a universal church setting can't be done. Notice chapter 7 and verse number 17. But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk. And so ordain I in all churches. If there was a, 
a universal church, he would not have to have to say churches. He would just have said church. Notice chapter 11 and verse number 16. Chapter 11 and verse number 16. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Oh, by the way, when he said churches, how different do you think the doctrine was among the churches of God in Paul's day? I would, have, I would say to you, basically none. If they were a church of God, they held to the same doctrine. And you know, what, what is amazing today is you can go all over the world, and if you are a Bible believer, you can find a group of people that believe like you. And what is amazing, all the different countries I've gone to, I found a group of people, and none of them were taught in, in, in schools in the United States of America. But you start asking them questions about doctrine. Oh, I believe that. Well, why do you believe that? Because it's in the Bible. Uh, I, I, yeah, I believe that. Why? Because it's in the Bible. Uh, you won't find why believe Why do you believe it? Well, that's what I was taught in school. You won't find that. Why? Because they're either Bible believers or they're men taught people. And there's a big, big difference. Now, here's a question. In 1 Corinthians 12 and verse number... 12 and 13. Would Paul change from a local church teaching context, which has been true at all the verses I've looked at, would Paul change from that local church teaching context and change to a universal church teaching context without identifying the change? And I submit to you, no, he wouldn't. And I submit to you, no, he didn't. <laughs> Here's another question. Is there a Bible letter written or addressed to a universal church? The answer is no. Every single one of them is written to a visible local church. Now, I said in the positions, to the group's positions, the, the Catholics hold to a universal, visible. The Protestant fundamentalist holds to an invisible universal. But here's a thought for you. There's a synonymous word for universal. And here's the synonymous word, Catholic. The word Catholic means universal. So I think you, there's a little hint there of where the false teaching of a universal church comes from. It comes from the Catholics. And see, the 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 13, is teaching a visible, particular, that was the church at Corinth, local congregation. It is not teaching a universal, invisible, mystical body of all believers. Now, I, as I said last week, believe that the church is local. I believe that Every local church should have members in it that are only saved. Now with that said, I believe in the kingdom of God. I believe in the family of God. I believe in the bride of Christ. And I believe in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, in verse number 5 of chapter 1 of Acts, and again, Acts chapter 11 and verse number 16. All point to one event. The four verses we saw in Acts, uh, in the Gospels, again, Acts 1, 5, Acts 11, 16, gives us six references. The four Gospel references were perspective, looking forward. Acts chapter 1 and verse number 5 was perspective, looking forward to the fulfillment of the promise. The Acts eleven sixteen is looking back to the fulfillment of the promise. So Acts eleven sixteen was reflective. He was thinking about the Pentecost experience, and he even mentions that. Therefore, we conclude that the baptism of the Spirit cannot be sought for. 
It is not an ongoing event. It was for the transitional period of the book of Acts. Therefore, it, as it being a transitional period, it is a concluded event because it was done. And again, it was an event where God was showing the Jew His plan for the church. And again, go look sometime in Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 14 through 16. You'll see more there about what I'm talking about. We conclude that the Holy Spirit does not baptize anyone. But the believers in Acts were baptized with the Holy Spirit for the purpose of empowering them. We conclude that the Spirit baptism in Acts is not the same as water baptism. We conclude that it is equal to the promise of the Father that we looked at in Luke 24, that we looked at in Acts 1, verse 4 and 5, and that we looked at in Joel chapter 2, in verse 28 and following. And we also looked at Acts chapter 2 and verse number 16, where Peter even said, this is the fulfillment of that which Joel said. We also conclude the baptism and the gift of tongues is not the same. And we can look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 30 and 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse number 5 as proof of that because Paul taught about tongues there and he didn't even mention anything about baptism of the Spirit there. It was talking about a gift of tongues. So the baptism of the Spirit at Pentecost and the gift of tongues are not the same thing. Two different things. We also conclude that the baptism of the Spirit in the book of Acts and the indwelling of the Spirit is not the same either. See, we're indwelt, as a believer, we are indwelt with the Spirit. The carnal Christian, the baby Christian, and the spiritual Christian are all indwelt. Might not be controlled, but we are indwelt. By the way, Acts chapter 2 doesn't say that the Spirit came and indwelled them. Nowhere in Acts chapter 2, and we'll see that and I'll prove that to you. It does say they were filled. Now, we're commanded to be filled when Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 18. We also conclude that the baptism of the Spirit was for, only for the book of Acts. Only for the book of Acts. <laughs> Time. We know in chapter 2 of Acts, the Spirit filled them, they spake in tongues, and people heard the gospel in their own language. So the gift of tongues is a clear language. Go with me to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Notice verse number 12. It says, For when they believed Philip preaching the things, but when they believed Philip preaching things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued to Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard at Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they come prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when they laid their hands on them, they received the Holy Ghost. And when, Peter, and when Simon saw that through laying on the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee because thou hast thought that, notice this, the gift, and that gift goes back to receive the Holy Ghost in verse 19, of God may be purchased with money. Now here, 
It doesn't say that this group that received the Holy Ghost here spake with tongues. But they did something that caused Simon to know they had received the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say what it is. All right, go with me to chapter 11 and verse number 17. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as He did us. Now notice, Peter, two places. is saying receiving the Spirit of God in its power is a gift of God. By the way, that again is a fulfillment of Joel chapter number 2. Now we've already seen in chapter number 10 that they received the Holy Ghost and they spake in tongues. Okay? Notice chapter 19. And what we're doing in these passages is all the passages in the book of Acts that talks about them receiving the Holy Ghost. Chapter 19, and notice verse number 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. He said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, and that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came upon them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Now, this setting, of course, you have about 12 men, according to verse number 7, that Paul comes in contact with. And he finds out in talking to them that they were not saved men. They had accepted the preaching of John, but they hadn't heard about Christ yet. They only heard, you need to believe on the one that comes after me. And they had heard this from Apollos. Now go back over to chapter number 11, verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only, notice this, knowing only the baptism of John. Now that's what these men in chapter 19 know. Only the baptism of John. Now notice verse 26. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded to him the way of the Lord more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass through Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the brethren to receive him, who when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace. Now notice, these twelve men heard Apollos preach and they accepted the baptism of John, but they didn't know about Jesus yet. Because only Apollos was preaching the baptism of John at that time. Now Priscilla and Aquila straightened him out, and then he went on his way preaching Jesus. And Paul had to straighten these 12 men out in chapter 19. When they got saved, then he laid his hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now I have given you every single place in the book of Acts where the Holy Spirit come upon people. And I say that to say this. The baptism of the Spirit was a transitional for the transitional period in the book of Acts to bring the Jew to the understanding that God is putting the Gentile in the church. Once that transitional period was over, and the reason Paul didn't teach about it in a bunch of Corinthians when he talked about what the Spirit of God was going to do is because it was already done by that time. It was a completed thing. No other writer speaks about it in the whole, all the Bible. If no other New Testament epistle talks about it, why in the world do the charismatics get so excited about it? Because it's false teaching. It's not Bible teaching. And it's been so confused out there that even Baptist churches have been sucked into it. Why? Because they've been taught it by a pastor that was trained in a Protestant school and he's preaching and teaching a Protestant position instead of a Bible position. Another conclusion, it is not an experience to be sought at, sought for by a believer. I rest my case.
Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you that your spirit will lead in your word. And we pray, Lord, that we would always stand upon your word. Bless us for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take some prayer requests, please. We've got a bunch of sick people around tonight.